Welcome back, weary travelers, to Recorder on the Wall. I'm your host, Matthias720. I'm your other host, Jeremy. I'm your host and producer, Peter. And uh, we may get Katie later. We didn't hear from Drew or Scars this week, so... All right, so yeah, we finally rounded out this book that apparently all of us are, are discovering that we're not the biggest fans of anymore. Yeah. yeah. Still kind of better than book one of Legend of Luke. A lot is better than book one of Legend of Luke. Yeah, like, at least stuff is happening in this book, and it's not just, let's eat. Oh, there's evil people. Let's eat. Ooh, there's evil people. Let's eat. <laughs> No, there is plot here. We have the yeah. more interesting plot about Sunflash. And, and we the also not as have... interesting titular plot. Yeah. I, I think we've said this enough already, but yeah, I think all of us would have rather put the book just about Sunflash. Not enough outcast. Four out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> so the name when... of the book is a lie. <laughs> when we left off. I recall correctly. Vale had just been kicked out of the abbey with a with a giant boot to the backside. Yep. Or at least literally kicked out. <laughs> it's tail between version. his legs. Yep. And uh, he promised to come back with an army. Blah blah blah. And uh, yeah. And then meanwhile, Swart was heading for the mountain. And he has a captain Zigu Zigu Zigu. Sure. Zigu. Uh, on his side. Well. I hope you like this character because he's not around for long. Sorry. <laughs> so, yes, uh, when we pick up, we find out that we'll come to the much better A plot here in a moment. Uh, but not only is Veiled up the Abbey and he's not going back, his adoptive mom is following him with Target. Uh, she doesn't take the hint either, like, Hey, maybe we should. You know, he he's been kind of an outcast. Oh, I could totally change him if I find him and teach him to be better. <laughs> the power <Yeah>. of art. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Friendship. Uh, but yeah. even I, I I think everybody put this in their notes here. When Brian is discovered missing, both the Abbess and Bella were like, "Well, some lessons are going to have to be learned on our own." Should we send yeah. one after her? Eh. Miriam at least says like we should probably send someone after her and Bella's like no this is someone that she needs to do on her own like this is on the same level as she's lost the will to live yeah, I'm gonna call Bella out here no you you really should at least send like either like Skipper and a couple of his otters out for her just to keep protect her because we all know how dangerous moss flower can be why not send jod with her he was at least one of the more entertaining redwall characters this time around hmm. this is, everyone else has just been blandy from blandville but no no they don't send anyone after her and target just basically is following her anyway yeah Dinny light well he is the grandson didn't yeah. he? but not as good no no he doesn't even say stand on my tunnel once. Come on. Well, stand on my tunnel. <laughs> yeah. And so the at the actual battle, you know, meanwhile, back at the plot at Salamandastron, uh, I like how Swartz like, we're going to attack, a, do a pincer attack, and Zigu questions it. And I got to agree. What's the point of attacking a mountain that's completely closed up from two sides? I will attack both of their non-entrances. We can climb up and find a window. Um, I think they might plan for that. Yep. I mean, um, well, we found out. We find out how well that goes in a little bit. And we do get more signs that Swart really is still bad at picking like reliable allies because it's obvious Ziggy's going to betray him at some point. Well, he kind of sees that coming, but it seems like. That's kind of Swartz's routine in this book. It's like, revenge on Badger, take care of somebody who's plotting against me. Revenge on Badger, take care of somebody who's plotting against me. Man, everyone hates me. Huh. Well, maybe, maybe I'm the problem. Doing that Badger. <laughs> maybe I'm the problem. No, 
No, it's the young, it's the young vermin who are wrong. It's everybody else, it's the young vermin. <laughs> it's the, it's those millennial vermin. <laughs> hey, aren't we millennials? Uh, I choose to ignore that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I love how Zigu then, of course, doesn't really come back with a better plan because he goes. Oh, we should do a show of force. Maybe they'll surrender. Yeah, on what planet are the Long Patrol Hares and the Badger Lord of Salamandistron going to surrender to you? Okay, if Stonepaw and his geriatric squad aren't going to surrender to Ungatron and his billion troops, yeah, I, I don't think you're going to accomplish anything. I don't think the word surrender is in the Long Patrol lexicon. Just saying. No. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if... Honestly, I could see Redwall considering surrendering, but this is Salamander Strong. This is the type that goes down fighting. No well, in, the cartoon, what. in the cartoon, we did see Redwall consider surrendering. Yeah, they did. <laughs> so we also have, on the other part of the good plot, we have the Hares and Sunflash preparing for this, and I don't. we never really go into what the hair education system is inside the mountain for youngins and long patrol training but it's clear that they've done this before they even know how to plan for a badger lord who loses his stuff and goes off goes off the deep end inside of their hated enemy <laughs> I, I, I do love the light when sunflash does do that i love the oh my giddy aunt yeah it's just like oh well that was kind of expected <laughs> But yeah, they they actually show some tactical intelligence here. One, they plan they make trench traps, which <laughs> get some pretty ugly use. But yep. just there's a specialized unit called the sleepers, whose whole pretty job awesome is game. yeah, their job is basically to uh, basically dig trenches and hide in them, wait for the vermin to pass them, and then strike them from behind. I like this. I really like this idea and. I kind of wish we would have seen moles do this, like militaristic moles, like jumping up from underground or pulling vermin underground with them. Like that would have been pretty cool. Yep. And uh, yeah, so the battle finally gets going and Zeke is kind of our main point where we're watching all of this happen. And uh he loses a good, good portion of his troops to these first two actions. First, the sleepers make their action, and then they jump over their own traps that the vermin don't see, and and into the trap they go. Yep. And hey, you okay down there? No. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's that's gonna leave a mark. <laughs> I, I do like. Oh, we'll get to it, but I do. Uh... On a morbid level, like how the vermin decide to get around that trap. Yeah, they use their own their own uh, comrades' corpses to fill it yeah. in. That's oh, that's dark. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, and, I'd like to point out, I really, really like the duel between Sabertosh and Zigu. Let's get oh, into I that. Love that. Oh, this... I almost almost could hear uh, like Pirates of the Caribbean going off as those two were going off. But uh, the music, anyway. But yeah, what happens is Zigu takes up a spear and he wounds a female hair named uh, da, 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 Ford Petal. Yeah, and he continues, even though she's not quite dead, he continues to torture her with his his rapier. And Sabertash comes in and says, like, yeah, that's not cool, dude. Yeah, I uh, like his line of, why don't you try that on someone who can fight back? And mm -hmm. we get this that kind of quiet moment. I think you outlined this in your notes, Jeremy, where every, all, every, all the other activity stops to watch this happen. Yep. I'm a huge fan of scenes like this where you have like the two champions square off and the rest of the armies kind of stop for a minute just to watch what's going to happen. And this was just cool because Sabretosh just schools him. Hi, Katie. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hello. Sorry, we started a few minutes, so. Bye. That is totally fine. I was late, so, you know. Yeah, well, we kind of all were at some point. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we were just discussing, uh, we already mentioned the bad B-plot of, you know, Bryony kind of not getting that 
Vale's not coming back, but we're actually into the main A plot of Salamanistron attempting to be invaded. Yes. Did we get? Did we mention uh, Ford Pedal? Because that made me sad. That's actually right where we were. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Where uh, Sabretosh and Zigu are having their awesome duel. Oh yeah. Yes. And uh, yeah, Zigu kind of loses, and he tries to ask for mercy in very Shakespearean way, and nope. <laughs> yeah, Sabretosh just like huh, slash. That's the end of you. I gotta say, the voice actor who did this was amazing. Just like, learn to die like a soldier, sir. And then it's like, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, Zeke's kind of dead, which is the shame because he's actually entertaining. Just, just a little bit of, dead. Yep. He was one of the best villains, in my opinion, uh, as far as any of the captains that you see throughout the series because <clears throat> he's competent. He doesn't have like grandiose schemes. He's like, yeah, I do want to eventually try to take down my boss, but he isn't so overconfident that it gets in his way. He's practical. Exactly. Yep. And now he's dead. Yep. <laughs> and he's dead. So. Well, darn it. Yep. And then Sunflash sees Swart and goes, Rrr. Kill. Kill. Activated. Sunflash <laughs> smash! Sunflash! <laughs> strongest there is! Oh, man. <laughs> I see turning green! Yeah. Somebody smart. push the blood wrath button again. Yeah. <laughs> so his yeah. yellow stripe is turning green while his eyes turn red. He's like <laughs> turning all colors of the rainbow here. Well, yeah, I just get this going. Image. He's going an incredible hole. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I just get this image of him grabbing Swart by the leg and smashing him around and into a ceiling, and then walks away and goes, "Puny Swart." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would pay good money for someone to animate that. Yes. <laughs> but yes, and then and the hairs, even though their their leader just kind of charged down the mountain, and is not letting anything get in his way, uh, they, they react well enough. Mostly, ah, uh, crap. Yeah. yeah, I kind of feel sorry for the hairs. It's like, oh, man, they're like babysitters. Like, the kid yeah. got away again. They really are. <laughs> I do like that. Uh, sir? Oh, my giddy aunt. <laughs> yes. They're like, all right, do we better go out there and save him? Oh, now we're oh. beset from all sides. Great job, <laughs> Sunflash. Oh, I'm sure he's fine. Oh, they covered it in tent canvas. Yeah. Oh. Which I would like to point out, this is one of two moments in this story that Swart has an easy point where he can just kill Sunflash and doesn't do about anything about it. Yeah. Yeah, like, that's he's, true. He's being hit by arrows and things, and as we find out after this fight, Nightshade has poison. Why didn't you just pelt him with poison arrows? Problem solved. Well... And the story would be over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Swart's incompetence <laughs> makes the story continue. Indeed. So, yeah. yes. Unfortunately, back at the B plot. Oh, God. Yeah, I, I especially like the line, I will find Vale and bring him back, even though he has been de declared outcast and sent away. This is the worst plan ever. Yes. So First. where where exactly are we on the B-plot? Because I have a bunch of thoughts, but I don't want to, like, get ahead of myself. Well, we kind of uh, condensed it because we kind of all kind of hate it here. But we basically <laughs> point out that, uh, yes, Bryony left. She eventually runs into Target, who's been following her. But more importantly, we point out that Bella and the Abbess, like, hey, should we send someone after her? Uh, she'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's just Bryony's attitude toward Vale is, like, it's, it's not an... Maybe one of you can help me make sense of this because I feel like I don't make sense. I'm trying to articulate what I'm saying here. But, like, her attitude towards Vale is not, I think, completely fleshed out enough to make me care. Because it's like, on one hand, she, like, doesn't blame him for anything. Is like, oh, but you guys are always mean to him and that's why. But then... When we get to the point with the dorm mice, which I don't think we've got to. Have we got to that yet? No. Not the dorm Okay. Yeah. And she's like, she just doesn't talk about it. And so it's like part of being caring for someone who's not a very nice person 
is blaming the victim and Jake's doesn't get into it, which I think would be really interesting, but not very indicative of a Redwall character, which I don't think, I think is why he doesn't do it. But if she did, if she said like, Oh, I'm sure I'm the Dormice did something to make him do that, but she doesn't do that. So it just seems like her personality is just not complete because of that. Does that make any sense whatsoever? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it does tie back into book two where after he purposely tries to poison Friar Bunfold, she goes, I'm sure it was an accident. Yes. Yeah. He but, accidentally I mean, went into the infirmary and accidentally picked up the poison and accidentally went downstairs and accidentally yes. put it into his drink. <laughs> but I mean, if this was a more complicated character, she could have said something like, but Bunfold was always mean to him. So in a way, Bunfold had this coming and it's not Vale's fault. Yeah. But I, I just don't think Jake's wanted to go there because I don't know if that's a very complicated characterization, I think, and very flawed. And we don't want our main female character to be flawed. Oh, no. No, oh God, no, no. <laughs> we don't want to, we don't want to remove her rose colored glasses. No. Yeah. And why would you want to justify the behavior of what is supposed to be an ambiguous character if we can't make him more ambiguous yeah. by not saying anything? Uh, here's the thing. They all ain't ambiguous here. It, it, it's pretty obvious he's past the point break. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, we'll get to the foxes, yeah. but it's like they do antagonize him too. But like before that, we already see him attack a defenseless old dormouse. Which, as we've seen, the dormice are doormats in this series. They're I the get biggest, it. <laughs> they're the <laughs> biggest wusses. <laughs> you know, all bank voles are annoying, are annoying, and possibly evil, and all dormice are dorks. Well, so, except, for, except for baby Dumble, who attacked an eagle. Okay. You know. Dumble we was haven't cool. gotten to him yet, but yeah. 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 <laughs> but, and Rolo Bankfall is cool, but yes. so there are there are the exceptions, but yeah, and I'm just going to kind of limb here and be like, uh, so is it Bryony, or I've always pronounced it in my head as Brioni, and I'm probably it's wrong. Bryony in the audiobook, like Brian with a Y. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Bryony. <laughs> Um, it's like, okay, he's actually attacked someone that doesn't deserve it. Vale is bad. You need to help the door mice back to Redwall and just go home. Oh, yeah. you're going to just send the injured old dormouse and his two defenseless children on their way, even though, it, as you have said, it takes over a day to get to Redwall and you're still going to go after Vale, even though he doesn't deserve your kindness? Of course you are, because you're a twit. Yeah. It's like, it just doesn't make her look very smart or very likable, in my opinion. I just don't feel anything for her. Yeah. Here's like, the thing. No one to bring this up anyway. Um, sure. The character I ran to here to compare, and again, I'm pulling Game of Thrones because it's, well, it's easy and I'm an adult and I've read the <laughs> book. But Bryony actually reminds me part of the worst parts of Cersei Lannister in the books. And if you've never read books or show, uh, this is definitely one of the more bad characters there in the book however cersei is she's cunning she's manipulative but she, when it comes to even her own children she's not so much a mom as she just views them as political pawns to the point that she cannot see just how bad her oldest it, joffrey is like, oh, he's joffrey. a full-blown sociopath cruel i mean cruel he's mean-spirited he will torture people if it if it strikes his fancy and she either a makes excuses for it b or just doesn't care that because a he's her son and political pawn and her other kids aren't even really focused on in the picture until he's dead so yeah now while briny here is not clearly not like that there's some of that here too where she just can't see the fact that veil is pretty much point past the point of no return on morals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, she won't talk about what happened to the dormice. And when they come across the foxes, she's like, Oh, it was an accident. Like, yeah. Vale didn't well, do that. We'll cover the foxes. Itself. Yeah. yeah. Cause actually let's check in on Vale here because he first, as we've mentioned, comes across a small trot family of dormice, a grandfather and two grandchildren. And uh, he first tells him, hey, totally coming in peace. You totally don't have to worry with me, bonk. Ha ha, I've yeah. stolen your stuff. Ha 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 ha. And he runs away with their, with their gear and food. Yeah. 
I will say of the two characters going after Vale, like I at least can we can sympathize a little bit with Target because he's just being a loyal friend and like he knows that Bryony is kind of being stupid, but he's at least loyal enough to her that he'll to help keep her safe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do like Target, and I I want on a very much lighter note. I just gotta say the song he sings in the previous book, or I wasn't there, the one about the bumblebee that was like four lines long. Mm. Um, I sing that to my dad all the time because it annoys him because it says the bumblebee is a wonderful bird, and he's like the bumblebee is not a bird. Like every time he just gets so mad. And, so I sing that too. <laughs> and on that note, on yes. that note, the uh, little song that he sings to wake her up, wake you up just a brand new day, or I'll eat up all the vittles and run away. It's like yeah. <laughs> that that explains their relationship perfectly. There oh, you is go. Is anyone getting a Dr. Horrible vibe there? Because I am. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Okay. But that's more villain. Anyway, we also get, we do get briefly actually get one look into Vale's internal monologue, but it's mostly just, huh, I'm gonna be totally smarter than my father. No, you're yeah. not. No. Super. I'm the cleverest evil villain there is. Oh, I've been taken captive by two foxes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> vale wagers that he's physically stronger and more cunning than his father. Okay, yeah, you're younger. I'll grant you that. You are no match for a battle-hardened veteran who yeah. is <laughs> has made his way to the top by either by raw strength of beating his opponents or poisoning them. Yes. You're screwed, kid. <laughs> or convincing them to go into quarries filled with adders. And, yeah, oops, two foxes show up. Yep. But before we get to them, we get back to Sunflash, who has been smothered into unconsciousness. Yep. And we get one of my favorite chapter arts, 34, which is Spartan Hairs. <laughs> <laughs> this is Salamanestron! <laughs> And yeah, the, the, all the chapter art is the, the long patrol hairs with spears charging to go rescue Sunflash, and it is awesome. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they the hairs managed to make it to them, drive off the vermin, and Swart still ran away. <laughs> Sunflash is running right at him, and he's like, hey, um, everyone in front of me, <laughs> I'm totally not chickening out. Yes. There's something very important that I have to deal with that's not here. Uh, oh, I, I hear Vermin HR calling. I need to deal with something. I got, I got some, something in the oven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost wanted to have a scene where Sunflash sitting there and seeing Swart like run away and goes, "Such a weenie." I am not a weenie. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, he, he, well, you know what? I'm fine with that. He's a weenie. (laughs) (laughs) And just, I think it's the first indication that this battle is getting a little rushed is we have them stuck out on the shore and they're surrendered. And then within the same chapter, they're rescued by the uh, shrews, otters, and squirrels. Meanwhile, back in Martin the Warrior, when this when something like this happened, it was like three chapters long of them being stuck out near the ocean. And yep. it got, and it usually got a lot more desperate. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Sunflash. Uh, uh, I'm okay. Um. <laughs> Thump. I'm not okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah they wake him back up and. Uh, Basically, oh, guys, uh, we're totally surrounded. Oh, look, help. (laughs) Otters and and squirrels and shrews. Oh, my. Oh, my. (laughs) Get out of my head. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But yes. And then I also, we also get, so so basically the vermin are driven off and everyone's, and the, the, Good. The Salman just run Garrison and their allies are happy and they have a feast. And there is a brief scene with um, Bradders who's mourning his basically what he wanted to ask out sometime for uh, what's her name? Ford Pedal. Ford Pedal. Ford Pedal. Oh, that made me so sad. And it's almost it. It. I won't say it's out of place because what we know about Sunflash on how he's he's genuinely a pacifist unless he has to fight. 
and uh, where he actually he, he actually it's a kind of a tender scene where he's comforting one of his own troops. Yeah, and I mean he he's always he seems like a counselor to the young always, and so that this made perfect sense to me that he would do this. Just always make time to just talk talk to the young the young ones and and comfort them and stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. we get as we see like something like this in book two, where after. Um, Starbreeze and uh, or Breeze and Starbuck pass away where he takes the time to sit with the nurse that attended to them and you know kind of help her and just like give her you know say like no this is that they were ready to go and they were looking forward to seeing their friends again yep like he's, uh, he seems very personable yeah. yeah and it's it's just kind of just the the way that he said you know I was teasing her about you know how soppy she was and it's like he feels bad about that now it's just like i don't know it it just reminded me of there was a a, i was a camp counselor one summer and there was a student who had a close friend die and um and she was like yeah i used to tease him and now i feel bad i'm like you can't you can't think of it like that it's just how you know teenagers want to make it all about them like this was my fault (laughs) but yeah it, it just Without the blood wrath, he'd just be a nice, easygoing guy. But then, you know, yeah. <laughs> the blood wrath shows up. But yeah. <laughs> so yes, we finally. Uh, so yes, the bad battle's over, and then we're still with the a plot. Swart uh, hires an assassin. Yep, we get the greatest assassin in the history of the franchise. I do not understand. I don't know the about that. This. Like, I was what being was sarcastic. the point of this? <laughs> Yeah, which, though, this scene does give us the new dumbest name, uh, Glimpy the Rat. Oh, oh Glimpy. 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 <laughs> he just wanted to eat his mackerels in peace. God. So we're introduced to uh, Wraith, who's an assassin, and totally not a voice by, uh, totally not a French guy in a ski mask and a, blue, in a, and a nice dapper suit with a butterfly knife. <laughs> I like <laughs> I like Team Fortress too. Sorry, bad joke. (laughs) Extending the R's was just so weird. Like the the voice actor is like, "Just one stroke with me, kisser." (laughs) Okay, that is that is odd. (laughs) Yeah, this didn't seem to really accomplish anything outside of in a little bit we get the funniest death in the in the book. Uh, (laughs) Well, yeah, I, I suppose. Well, here's the thing. What it, it kind of struck me as out of character for Swart because mm, I've spent years of my life chasing down this badger that I'm going to kill slowly. Oh, oh, an assassin will do it. Eh, okay. I think at that point he was just tired of the whole thing. Like, man, just kill him off. <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, I'll totally give you half of every all the plunder. Uh, uh yes, nightshade. We got uh, that nice silver goblet. Okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> Unfortunately, then we have to go back to uh, the B plot where Vale is now at the mercy of two random foxes. Such a yes, terrifying Yes, and uh, their is. names. Hang on, I got this. Their Sarah. names are pretty stupid, too. Ren, Ren and Brule. Yes. Ren and Stimpy? Kangaroo. <laughs> 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 Veil, you idiot! <laughs> but yes, and uh, yeah, they're like, oh, hi, random ferret that we just found in the woods. You totally don't have anything fear to us. Ha ha, we tied you up and steal your food. <laughs> we have a knife and a stick. Ha ha! And it just proves how young he is and how petulant he is when he just proceeds to just throw a tantrum. It's like, what? Well, you guys are mean. I'm totally the my dad works at Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I I uh, I'm totally the son of six, uh, Swart Six Claw. My yeah. daddy will beat you up. <laughs> yeah, is he here, buddy? No. <laughs> my deadbeat dad will totally beat you up when she comes back from buying cigarettes. <laughs> Oh. It's totally not a phase. Come on. I'm like <laughs> seriously a threat here. Okay, from now on, whenever we need to do veil dialogue, we're doing in that whiny teen voice. That's <laughs> good. Much funnier. Emo veil it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, Shiny and Target rescue Veil from these foxes by throwing pine cones at them. 
Lots and lots of pine cones. Yep. Just to, where did they find all these things? <laughs> and uh, I, we then we then get Vale just being dumb and targets like his targets like Brian. He's like the only person that cares about you, and he's like, "Well, where was she when they chucked me out of Redwall?" Um, she was pleading for them to let you stay. Are you yeah. deaf? <laughs> or as well as stupid? Like, come on. Yeah. See, I would appreciate it so much more, so much more nuance in these characters. Like, maybe show Vale to be glad to see you, Brian. You're like, hey, I sh- you shouldn't have followed me, but you are the person who took care of me when I was a child. So maybe I'm a little glad to see you while telling you to go home and stay out of my business. You know, it just annoys me that these are so one-dimensional. Yeah. And he kind of knocks, he knocks Target over and steals their food anyway when he leaves. I hate you, Mom. (laughs) I'm going to live with Dad. Oh, boy. Yeah. And uh, right after that, we get the moment where Vale actually does kill two creatures. And this is the first time he actually kills something. And that's it. Like yeah, no... he doesn't have any hesitation. He doesn't even blink at this. He just outright kills him. Yep. Once and again, kicks... one dimensional. Yep. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and he kicks their bodies into the water, into the river. Yeah. Yep. Bye, foxes. <laughs> yep. We then get a uh, a new running gag that, or uh, something that I just realized is kind of a running gag in this franchise, whereas. The injured or tired or hungry character rants about awesome-sounding food. Yes. And, oh, man, I haven't had dinner yet, and I'm very hungry. Just realized that. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) But, yes. And we're still in the B-plot. We have a random hedgehog with with built a house on a raft. (laughs) At least if we're going by the chapter art. So. (laughs) I kind of like this family, though. They're funny. Yes. And these, let's see. Uh, Duddle and Tough, Tough, Tutty? Whole Spike. Yep. Yes. And they got two adorable children who, well, I'm not going to bother naming, even though they have names. <laughs> <laughs> the Matis Rosalie and I forget the little boy. Our Druno? Our, 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 I don't know. Our, A-R-U-N-D-O. Okay, our Arundo, I believe. Yeah, we'll go with that. I think. Sure. But yes. They're nice to they they're nice to Bernie and Target. They pick him up and it's like, okay, we'll we'll help you find your your terrible ferret person. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. what is super amusing in the audiobook is grown men and women doing child voices. <laughs> 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 it's like he has a lisp. He's like, he'll chop your tail off with a single swipe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's really funny. Yes, apparently this is uh, Tuddy's preferred method of. Pre- a threatened, a threatened punishment. If you don't yep. do what I tell you, I'm going to chop off your tail. Yep. To the point that I think pretty much that she may threaten other people later on. But we'll get yeah. back to that. Which, well, later on, the husband even goes, man, if it was up to you, this forest would be full of, like, chopped off tails. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's well, even cute. Like... Sorry, go ahead about that. Oh, it's just, this is the precursor to Krega scalping tails. Oh yeah. Mm. Oh yeah. So, and, and then we also see uh, there's this adorable uh, little song where, by the older sister here, who basically from that he learned she learned from her mom says, "I've learned to wash my poles and I'm going to be good." Yes. <laughs> and they see the two dead foxes and Brian. He's like, "Oh, it, mu- it must have been some terrible accident." Yeah. Come on. Uh, Right? So is he, isn't that Vale's name carved into their... Oh. <laughs> Somebody no, it was be trying them. to frame him. It wasn't his fault. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally not his fault that he snuck up on them and stabbed one and beat the other to death with his own spear. It was totally not his fault. He didn't mean it. And you can just, you can just picture the crickets as everyone else kind of blinks at her like... Yeah, it's. I and think Pocket. Talk... Yeah, doesn't yeah. he say something like it'll snow and it's summer or something like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it'll snow soon, even though it's midsummer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. And... and then, meanwhile, Vale has 
made himself his own boat, and he's totally falling asleep. And um, eh. I don't know. Is there a, is that a waterfall? Yeah, eh, he'll be fine. Yeah. Are there shop rocks at the bottom? Most likely. <laughs> Bring it on. Whee! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone. I'm glad someone got that. Where I was going with that. <laughs> You're welcome. I rewatched that movie recently. So. And back uh, okay. to Salamandastron. Yay, with, uh, the A plot. <laughs> we learn about a, a, a new otter dish that's uh, all the rage. Oh, so delicious. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure the, the Salamandastron dentist is going to be laughing about it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Where we, we see how professional things are being run in Salamandastron, where Sunflash is trying to have a work conference with Sabretosh and um, what's the other guy's Colonel name? Something, something? San Gol? Something? something? I don't know. Hang on. Uh, San Gol, yep. Yep, okay. And they're trying to have a serious conversation, then all of a sudden the two Otter Brothers run in, like giggling like schoolgirls, and be like, <laughs> and Sunflash goes, what did you do? Nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they got <laughs> nothing. Nothing. <Yeah. laughs> this is picture now. Them it's like Beavis, but <laughs> we made a <them> meat rocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they uh, they apparently they they covered with cream a bunch of frogs, um, and served it to Porty, uh, <laughs> and said, "Here, this is a total otter dish. You should totally try." Now, yeah. don't mind us. We're just gonna run away and laugh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Porty runs in, holding two rock creams. We're like, I'll rock cream you. And some flash <laughs> just kind of goes, they're right over here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and he throws them, the two otters duck, and poor Wraith, who had a really hard time climbing up the mountain, gets clobbered right in the face with the rock creams, stabs himself with his own poison knife, and falls to his death. <laughs> And Yay. no one even notices. Yeah, the most <laughs> and, yeah. valuable character is dead. Oh dear. <laughs> yep. And uh, we, did, we didn't mention the Wraiths. Yeah, he is, his particular weapon is a poison dagger, and it's apparently a stone dagger. And we're not even, not even bother to say, hey, what kind of poison is this? And nope, nope, it's just poison. He's not around long enough for it to matter. No. The only person who actually dies from him, besides himself, is poor Glimpy. Glimpy the rat. <laughs> And uh, I love it, too. Like, the only indication that they care is Sangal's like, oh, I could have sworn I saw some sort of creature outside. Yeah, it was probably just the light playing tricks on you. Yeah, it was probably yeah. nothing. Yeah. Hey, what was that loud thump sound we just heard outside the window? Eh. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> the ocean. It was the ocean. Yep. <laughs> oh, okay. Yep. Well, what's the seagull sound as, as they die for, new f for food? Sounds like not my problem. What's yep. that lightning sound as it struck his corpse? <laughs> <God>. <laughs> okay, okay. I gotta point out here. If his first natural camouflage was that good, you have to imagine that somebody at some time far in the future would come across the skeleton like, how did this get here? <laughs> yeah. Craig is like walking by. He goes, huh. Never noticed that before. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna do it with Farago, but that works too. <laughs> oh look, a weasel. Oh, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, and uh yeah, the big plan right now is because both armies are kind of at a at a hold because there's torrential rain coming down. Uh is uh eh. They're just kind of waiting it out, and Sunflash is like, hey, let's uh, leave a bare minimum of defenders at the mountain and take the fight right to them. We've got our best numbers possible. Yeah, okay. Sure. Why not? Sounds good. <laughs> It'll be easy. I'm sure we won't have any problems. Oh, they don't yeah. have any problems. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they really don't. It's just like they even point out that Sunflash's troops have the numbers disadvantage, but they still take out almost all of Swarp's troops except for like thirty. All right, <laughs> that was quick. And here's the other thing, other problem here. Normally, we get a few more named characters 
when it comes to the good guys when they with these huge battles when they die but I, i'm making i i counted because i you know i go through this mm-hmm. uh ford pedal is the only named hero that we know of that actually dies yeah. there are others that we're told who die off but we don't even know their names yeah like bradbury takes an arrow to the shoulder but that's about it yes so yes yeah. Swart wakes up and oh hey why are what what's why are all people t- uh, attacking us? Which by the way, Swart's not even the one that notices it. He's just like kind of chilling, and one of his soldiers who's trying to catch a fish looks over and goes, "Uh, boss, they're totally <laughs> charging us." Battle stations. Yes, yeah. Swart actually yells this, and I, I'm like, I'm thinking like, uh, now I'm picturing him in like a Star Trek uniform or <laughs> something. <laughs> Red alert! Just demanding an army of red shirts. <laughs> well, that's pretty much all the villains are in Redwall books, anyway. <laughs> pretty much. <Yeah. laughs> you got your Khan oh. Noonien Singh, and then you got your red shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, and it, we're back to and Swart, despite the fact that he was totally fine with an assassin killing the badger earlier. Oh, um, I get to do it. No one else touches him. Uh, boss, wouldn't it make more sense if we... No! <laughs> <laughs> it's like, boss, he's kind of killing most of our troops. No, save him for me. Even though I ran from him the other day, that was just... I had something in the oven. <laughs> it was so. a tactical retreat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. And, uh, yeah. This... Not only do they kill pretty much all his major troops, leaving him down to about 30. Yep. And... You get a kind of a weird moment where Sunflash gets knocked out for like the eight millionth time, and then Sabretosh stands on his back and goes like, "Charge!" Maybe don't stand on your Badger Lord's back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, bad form. <laughs> we also notice when it's all said and done here, and Sunflash is reeling from the blood wrath aftermath, and he's like, "Well, I know Sport got away. I should go after him." And uh. The hairs overrule him. I, I mean, I'm glad to see this. Like, they're willing to say, no, you're injured. You yeah. don't go after him. Or we will use our own forces to restrain you. Yeah. And yep. then for the first time in this section of the book, Scarlath finally shows up again. Oh, hey. We have not you seen been? him. We haven't seen him since, like, halfway through book two. Yep. Like, geez, he was such an important character in book one, and now, like, just, all right. Yeah, he just comes to Redwall and is like, yeah, bad guys are coming, bye! Yeah. (laughs) Shows up at Salamandastron for five minutes to be like, hey, give me that green rock you got there, and I'll round up everybody. See ya in book three! Yep. Well, you know what, at least he'll be around for the rest of this book and, you know, have... A good character arc, and oh, yeah. oh, well, about that. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. well, while the hares are burying hares, and I presume the otters and squirrels and shrews are burying their own, mm-hmm. uh, they notice, hey, where did Sunflash go? <laughs> oh crap! <laughs> and Sangal even like berates the nurse, where he's like, "It's gonna be out until midday, huh?" Hmm. <laughs> wasn't my fault the bird woke him up. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's the well, bird's I mean, fault. <laughs> yeah, it's the bird's fault. <laughs> Sleeping draught for three normal creatures is probably not enough to take out a badger lord for more than a 15, 20-minute nap, tops. Unless True. your sister may. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Sister may could have knocked out the entire mountain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Fortunately, Sandigal, he gets, he's like, okay, we need about 12, get, gather 12 of us, I'm going with them, and, uh, I know Sandigal, he's like, I'll take the mountain, Sabretash, you go out and get, br- drag that stupid Badger Lord back by his tail. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We then, uh, cut back to Vale, where he enjoys a nice trip, and we'll see him next fall. Waterfall! <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of that. <laughs> well, I guess that's the end of Vale. Yep. <laughs> and, uh... Oh, of course he survives. Yeah, he's Aww. fine. Then, uh... 
Brian Ian Target fall down the hole. <laughs> yep. Yeah, they, like... they leave the hedgehog raft and kind of travel after Vale yeah. being stupid. Like, hey, he, we're pretty sure he went down this, went over this giant waterfall and he's probably dead. Okay, we need to climb down after him. Yeah. No, do we really have to? Yes. <laughs> well, we, I and... mean, to give Brian a credit, at least she knows Vale pretty well. Cause she's like, if we survive this, I'm sure he did. <laughs> <laughs> and we're total wusses, so it's yeah. probably... <laughs> yeah, Vale may have survived, but you have no guarantee he's in one piece. Oh, he just blocked you in the cave. Oh, look, there's some of them over there, and over there, and yeah, like over that, there. Yeah, like that little bowl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was getting kind of morbid, too. <laughs> he's like, smash bits of ferret everywhere, blood everywhere! <laughs> Whack. Yes. Just so, yeah, we... We ran into a random bankful who was just like, get off my property. Also, your ferret's dead. <laughs> yeah. And then they run into another bankful who's like giggling, who's essentially like gulling it up, being like, he, he fell off the waterfall. <laughs> There's blood everywhere. <laughs> that is and exactly a... the voice in the audiobook that is the that is done for the, <laughs> Wait, for really? the bankful. <laughs> yes. Strange minds think alike. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> and it's like his little, when he hurts his face and he like starts crying, it's so funny. It, I think it's a Brian Jake's son that does it, Mark Jake's. And it's just really funny. That's great. <laughs> oh, man. And yeah, Brian and Target admitting the fact that they don't have any climbing equipment are like, all right, let's climb down these slippery rocks. Nothing could possibly go wrong. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> and uh, it switching back to Swart, we find out that Bella apparently likes to disrupt Nightshade's visions for giggles. I don't know. Uh, she's, she's very she's, bored. That that might be where Martin learned it from. Was like, hey, tried to have a vision. Hello. Yeah. Hey, what you doing? <laughs> yeah. Hi. <laughs> I, I see I you're trying to have a, a future vision. Would you like some help with that? <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Please, I just got Clippy out of my head. I don't need him back in there. <laughs> I blame you. And you know, and most of our younger listeners are going to have no idea what we meant about this joke. No, that's sad. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, uh, I'm total. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure those two are fine. Yay! Back at the A plot. Yep. Which we get uh, in the A plot. We actually hit a, one of the f only times I've, I think I've ever seen a um, typo where it's two of the hairs catch up to Sunflash and it says Sunflash turned to the two horses. Huh. Oh, that is definitely hmm. corrected in the audiobook because that was not in the audiobook. Oh, okay. I wonder if that's in the Kindle version I have. Oh, I have like the original paperback release. Hang on, I'm checking. Which means, actually, it didn't get fixed from the hardcover to the paperback. Okay, what page is it on for the paperback? Um, on the paperback? Hang on, let me find it. Let's see. Da -da -da. Uh, I have page 309 is when they catch up to him. Let's see. It's page 317 on the paperback version. Halfway down the page. Well, I must have a different page yep. count. Yep, I see it. Two horses. Yep. Wow. That works what? too. I, I just what? I, I mm. Microsoft Word, you have some explaining to do. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh. Yeah, uh they must have corrected that to the Kindle version because I can't find the word horse anywhere. Okay. Oh, that's a good thing. Yep. And, uh, yeah. We oh, get... yeah. Huh? Say Nightshade. Hey, sir, I'm not serving you, but we really need to plan this smart. So, uh, can, uh, let me stay back with a few and we'll shoot poison arrows at him. Okay. <laughs> and Swords like, he had something else that could have been brought to my attention yesterday. <laughs> Uh, I also do also mention that among Seer characters that we will see and have seen, Nightshade's power, you know, Seer abilities don't 
really come into play here at all. I mean, she has visions, but they don't really have any effect on the plot. Yeah. I mean, the and... best she gives is, hey, your son's still alive. Oh, oh okay. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, I'm sorry, can you tell me something important? Well, you totally get victory, but then this old badger appears in my vision, and Swart's like, I'll just kill her too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And okay. we get Nightshade, uh, which I like the fact that Nightshade obviously collapses over from exhaustion, and Swart's method of getting her to keep moving is kicking her. Yes. <laughs> But like, hey, get up. Whack, whack, whack. That's totally going to work. Vermin HR is like, no, no. <laughs> I think they left Vermin HR behind. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> They're probably Fell negotiating the with the long patrol and the hair for, you know, the filling up the, the notification of next of kin forms. Yeah. yeah. Filling well, HR is like, how did you kill that Wraith guy? Who? Huh? We don't have any record of that. What, what are you yeah. talking about? Hmm. Yeah, yeah there, I can imagine the two HR departments are just comparing notes after the battle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're just going to downsize back to our uh, original uh, size before we incorporated. So uh, you're not needed anymore. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, did we, and there's Vermin HR on the beach. Hey, guys, did we just get pink slipped by Swart? <laughs> Man, the union is gonna have a fit. <laughs> oh, man, old man Ashleg is gonna be pissed. <laughs> <laughs> Very old by now. Yep. Now they could kill me. I'm Ashleg. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get, uh, yeah, nightshade shoots Scarlath with a poison arrow. Wait, what? And yep. Yeah. And huh, that happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like why I, I just have to question why he dies. For sad times. We needed some sad times. I guess, we but like they don't focus on it very much. I mean Sunflash gets pissed off and really oh. takes it oh. to him, but Oh yeah. I mean Nightshade obviously didn't see this part coming. But, nope. yeah, like, he is furious, and she trips and falls and looks back and goes, No, Lorna, yeah! <laughs> yep. That's it. And, and Sunflash um, beats her to a greasy paste. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, but I don't know. It just, it doesn't seem to have, like, a big effect on the rest of the story. Like, we get a sad moment here's the later. Question. Huh? Yeah, he, well, here's my question. What? What's the point? Yeah. I mean... Literally, was there any reason to kill off Scarlet? No. Like, I mean, it's not like it was needed to push the story forward or anything. It's not like, you know, Sunflash needed another reason to want to kill Swart and Nightshade. I mean, yeah. I think, I guess, to just show that war is pointless and violent and sometimes people die for no reason. I don't know. Maybe Jake's looked back and went, "Oh, I only killed one of the one of the named hairs. Guess I better kill another named character." Right. <laughs> I'll do one the audience has been watching since the beginning. Yep. <laughs> right. Scarlet literally came back just to die. All Hi, right. Sunflash. I'm back. Hurt. I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Though we do get a good, at least one good moment out of it, where Sunflash is just sitting there and does like the call like the whistle call and then nothing happens and he just oh, lets yeah. like the leaf float away like that was at least a well done moment but mm -hmm. that feels like all that's ever done with it for the rest of the story uh, all at least until the epilogue nice. yeah the epilogue oh, yeah. yeah it's um, like if there was uh, an animated uh adaptation done you could almost say okay Hey, I'm here to die. Wait, what? And then you just <laughs> do a quick cut to a gravestone and be like, dude. Yeah. And um, so that happens. And Swart 
takes the opportunity. He's like, okay, we're uh, we're getting the heck out of here. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And meanwhile, Bryony and Target wake up and they're like, oh, we're alive. And Vale, wait, come back. We'll totally follow you into this not this totally conspicuous cave. Oh, oh my gosh, the rocks have accidentally fallen down and accidentally blocked us in here. I'm sure you're totally innocent of doing this. Yes. And oh. they will they'll face boss outside the cave. Really? Yeah. And but then he meets his dad. Yeah, uh, Swart just walks on from stage right. Uh, mm. Hi, Dad. Yep. That was such a touching reunion. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's like two, which this actually kind of foreshadows the very brief reunion we get later on in the book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And there, there's a moment in it that so where um, Vale refers to Sword as Deadpaw, which I liked that insult, but how does Vale know that Sword's six claw is damaged? Well, I can see it's not working. I mean, it's obviously wrapped up in this big male thing that he's flailing about, <laughs> much like a mace, <laughs> just True. attached to his arm. <laughs> and yes, this this uh, introduction's differently. It's like, huh. Oh, I get it. You're my dad. Oh, yeah. I had a son. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and That's a nice. wife, but nobody mentions her, ever. Who? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, never mind. Never mind. I had a son that just materialized out of nowhere. <laughs> out of the cabbage patch. Yes. So, it's like, uh, hi. Yeah, he's like, ah, Vale, who gave you that stupid name? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't even remember what I named you, but, uh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, no, it'll come to me. Did I even yeah. name him? Did I care? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even Swart remember sending even... birthday cards. Yeah, and <laughs> Swart doesn't even acknowledge it. And he's like, oh, do you have a lot of enemies? And Vale actually gets a good moment where he goes, yes, there's the one longtime foe that, like, the, like, trash that I call father or something like that. Like, that uh, was actually a pretty good moment. Uh, uh, sounds like a jerk. Yep. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but Swart's just like, whatever. Uh, okay, yeah. you're here. You can. And Vale doesn't really give him much reason to care either, because Vale's just kind of insulting and whiny. And, yeah. Like, and you never give me it's... attention, Dad. <laughs> the ear that Vale's like, so where's that pack of cigarettes you went out for? What? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. Huh. Oh yeah. So yeah, your mom died giving birth to you. Uh, have fun with that complex kid. <laughs> <laughs> Sucks to be you, I guess. Well, you you buried her, right? Bury. <laughs> it's like cuts back like these <laughs> like bleached out bones sitting on top of a of a hill. Actually, in yeah. story, they did bury the poor uh, Bluefin, but oh, they did. Oh, they yeah. Did. In a shallow grave, but they did bury her. <laughs> a shallow grave. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And uh, we then, on a more important note, they find Bat Mount Pit. And we get the bats again. Yay. I forgot about these guys. I like I the forgot. bats. Huh. And we get a neat bit of continuity where we find out that the door that Logalog helped the, rat, the bats set up in Mossflower is still there and being used. Hooray! Yay! And for some stupid reason, the vermin are trying to shoot the bats. Yeah, just oh, they're for bored. Fun. They're bored. Because Even Vale points out. <laughs> Even Vale points out this is kind of stupid and a waste of arrows. When you've got the <laughs> badger after you. Yeah. And Swartz like, do you always insult people that could kill you? And Vale's like, well, I did poke fun two foxes that had me under po- uh, knife point, so. Yeah. Huh. Maybe there's something to me after you. Yeah. I... <laughs> and uh, Sunflash sees where they are and starts going after them and kills a couple rats or stoats by throwing them off a cliff. Well, before he does that, he does unbury Bryony and Doggett. Well, I figured that, you know, I wanted to get to the important stuff. Yeah, well. <laughs> 
and he meets up and he doesn't even i don't think does they do they even explain why they're there or why they're after it or does some flesh even care I don't uh, think so. I don't much think like so. the readers i don't think he cares No. Yes, and the bats are back. Yay. Uh, Lord Duskin is like, oh, hey, welcome. Uh, Can you fix this air wound? Yeah, vermins are kind of being a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> and Sunflash is like, oh, I'll take care of this and gets hit in the back of the head again. Yep. Oh, God. I know I made it. I can't keep making brain damage jokes. It's going to get old. <laughs> What do you mean, Dane Bramage jokes? I don't hear any Dane Bramage jokes anywhere. <laughs> These are very serious matters. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, like, so he gets captured and Brian, and he's like, I'm going to go help him. Yeah, what are you? Okay, fine, whatever. Go get yourself killed. I don't care anymore. Yep. And we get the moment where Swart finally has captured Sunflash and could easily kill him and... I just get like a whole Dr. Evil and his son Scott vibe off of this scene with Swart and Vale. <laughs> where Vale's like, all right, you know, it took you forever. You finally captured him. Are you actually going to kill him right now now that you haven't met your mercy and he's unconscious? And Swart's like, no, instead I'm going to wait until morning and do it slowly, even though we're beset on all hot sides by hares and bats. Oh, you do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I had more of an Incredibles vibe where it's like, I have to monologue. You don't get it. You don't understand what it's like to be a true villain. It's like, well, duh, Dad. I'm a real villain. I just know that you got to kill people first. <laughs> or else, yeah. like, you look, could, you could argue I'll go that. get a spear and stab him right now. It'll be fun. We can do it together. Real father and son bonding. You just don't get it, do you, Vale? Or I was going to argue this could even be a, like a Mega Man mind kind of thing. <laughs> Oh, son, you don't get it. You're not a v proper villain yet. You're just a little jerk. Oh, yeah? What's the difference? Presentation! Presentation! <laughs> and, well, well... What the hell does that mean? You've got the badger at your mercy, and he's tied up. And he'll probably break free of those bonds when he wakes up. He's waking up. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's not like some random, annoying, goody-two-shoes character is going to show up and free him. Hey, where'd that mouse come from? Yeah. <laughs> and to Vale's credit, when Briny does get captured, but pointed out, hey, uh, he's just like, uh, Briny, you should run. He yeah. actually said, he doesn't actually outright say don't kill her, he just says get the hell out. He yeah. does say leave her alone. Oh, he does he? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's probably but... more of the sounding of leave her alone! Yeah, and it's like, this is what annoys me, because this comes out of nowhere. We had no indication in this entire arc that he cared about Brian at all and now he's like oh no my mommy it's <laughs> like no that that doesn't work you got to put something in there to make this believable and it really isn't it was plot convenient love yes, yes. and then Swart tries to kill Brian because he's annoyed and she's trying to free F Sunflash and Vale steps in front of the javelin yeah huh yeah. Ouch. That, and he, I just can imagine he's looking down like, huh, that happened. That, was, that wasn't there <laughs> a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Sunflash wakes up and... Sunflash smash, puny ferret! Sunflash strongest there is! <laughs> Pretty much. Like a plank hitting rotten fruit, was it not? Yeah. I was, just, I was like, that is very graphic. <laughs> yeah, he just like bashed Swart in the head and probably cracked his skull. <laughs> you know... One good smash deserves another, which yeah. I like the fact that it took Swart a giant piece of stone to damage Sunflash's head, where Sunflash just punches him. Yeah. And then picks him up and does, like, just the Darth Vader throwing him into the pit. And crunch, 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 crunch. Oh, yeah. that's the end of that. And then you get you gotta imagine one of his one of his officers looks over the edge. Oh, he might be okay. <laughs> oh, not anymore. Yeah. We should probably get out of here, right, guys? Yeah. yeah. Oh, hairs. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure they're totally going to be... Oh, wow. Yeah, hairs are kind of killing them. Yeah, that's the end of them. And Vale's like, eh, uh, I'm okay. I'm less okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. No, he that... actually tells he tells uh he tells her, eh, go away. You should have gone back to your abbey. <laughs> Let me uh, sleep. I'm gonna sleep now. <laughs> yeah, and she says the dumbest thing. She's like, You saved me. Why? It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's like i finally realized you were a jerk this whole time wait a minute you saved me darn it i was having a character revelation yeah. and then he looked he, he, i could just see him looking at the camera like really <laughs> really <laughs> the stuff he, i he does, put up with <laughs> that a side glance where he just kind of looks to the side doesn't move his head just kind of looks over his eyes kind of makes like the what the heck just happened sort of <laughs> And yeah. then goes back and looks at the character and begin, continues to address, like, that aside never happened to begin with. I'm just going to go on and uh, ignore the whole thing. Yeah, yep, I'm just going to die if it gets me away from you, lady. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. There goes Swart and Vale. Huh. Yep. That was quick. Very. Yep. And Sunflash is totally fine, and he's totally not continuing to bleed. Oh, God, he's bleeding yeah. everywhere. <laughs> well, though, when uh, Bryony does free him, it said that he had dried blood, so, you know, it all just scabbed up well, over his head. we're also told that at one point he kept... Sunflash catches Swart's blade in his paws directly, and oh, regardless right. of how much he's getting cut up, snaps <laughs> it in half. It's, it's like every ba so many badger lords in this series forget that they have weapons. <laughs> yes. Yep. You know, I, I think, I mean, granted, this is not on the same level as Krega spending the first chunk of the book actually making a new pike. And then when she finally sees her opponent, she throws it to the side and starts strangling him. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'll get there. But yep. everyone gets healed and the, and they're, then they were like, hey, oh, you know my mom? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, tell me all about her. Tell yeah. me all about the mommy I never knew. <laughs> and Bryony's like, well, she's a much better mom than I am. <laughs> Aw. And then there's Target look again, looking at the camera, rolls in his eyes, and turns back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we do get a funny moment though on their way back. The bank full, not the not the golem one, but the other one. It's like, what are you doing trespassing in my domain? And then Sunflash just slams his mace in the ground and goes, "I am Sunflash the Mace, Lord of Salamandrastron. Want to fight about it?" No, sir. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, it's even better than that. The uh, full line is, I am Sunflash the Mace, Badger Lord of Salamadastron, and I like a bankful for breakfast each morn. Who are you? <laughs> Hot breakfast? <laughs> I, I'm standing in the new section of the river. <laughs> <They're>... Oh. <laughs> That's terrible. I prefer. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's that bit from Lord Brocktree where, hey, a Badger Lord gets 200 votes and a sword gets an additional 100. We're going. <laughs> How many votes does the mace get? Enough. Yeah, and we get a cut back to Blandwall Abbey. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I forgot. They were yeah, they're still in the story. Yeah, and they're like, well, people are coming. Let's do our generic feast prep. Yay! And there's also a uh, a riddle poem at the end that I, I honestly didn't care to solve. Yeah, and uh, oh, another nice little bit of continuity. We get Woodship Creek. Ah, I like oh, that. Yeah. Good for them. And then Avis, without telling anyone, oh, yeah. Let's make some. We're going to send out a few extra places, okay? At, at the, at the, why? Oh, I do like, no reason. I, I do like the fact that at the moment, all they really know is that it's Sunflash and like a couple hairs, and Bryony's coming back, and there's like maybe one or two others. And they're like, How much food should we make? About double. Yeah. <laughs> like three hairs or like two hairs are coming. We need double the food. This is well, driving me nuts because I hate surprises. Like I've I've discovered this about myself. I I turned thirty last June, and people, lovely people, I love them so much. But I had two surprise parties in like a month, and I'm like, this is so anxiety inducing. I don't like this. I love you guys, but I do not like surprises. <laughs> but 
we finally get back and uh why like oh and Bella's like huh I totally know my son's coming to me wait what we just didn't a dream Martin told me he was coming wait yeah. what yeah it's like by the way Martin's totally gonna show up uh in spirit form from now on and help us out and I do like that, that we actually get to see the genesis of that. Yeah. Oh, he's very he's very bored in the afterlife. Yeah. <laughs> His dad won't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but Sunflash and the crew show up at the Redwall Abbey, and we actually get this really good moment. It's unfortunately too short of yeah. Sunflash finding his mom. <laughs> yeah, we, it's like two lines. Mother, son, that's it. <laughs> that's it. This whole thing that we've essentially been waiting on for a while now because we knew Sunflash was alive at the beginning. We find out Bella's still alive halfway through the book. This, that's it. Like, I mean, the next chapter focuses more on the hares whose names I forgot. Yes. Yeah, I will say the reunion in Tagarong is a lot more satisfying. Yeah. Mm. And like, I mean, it's a good moment, but it's only a moment. Right. But I mean, we're told that later that, uh, that Sunflash doesn't leave Redwall until his mom's dead, but... Some interaction would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Where the hell have you been? Your room is still dirty in Brock Hall. <laughs> it's like, Mom, you guys abandoned the place. Every room is dirty in Brock Hall. You ran off with my motorcycle. Did you bring it back in good condition? <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a swamp involved. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, then we get a pointless bit of epilogue with the Abbas and Bryony, and the Abbas is like, Oh, I guess I was wrong. Vale did do something good. And Brian, he's like, nah, he sucked. Yeah, pretty like, much. What? That shows maturity. Not really? Yeah, like, like, he'll, that... be a, he'll be a great abbess in the future. What? Yeah, that is such a weird moment of character growth. It's just so abrupt. And, uh, yeah, I, I've just talked about this enough, but I just, yeah. Meh, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Let's just go with every Red Wall character in this book stinks. Yeah. I do like Jod, though. Although he's not technically a Red Waller. Yep, that means he's exempt. He's good. <laughs> oh, and we see Myrtle is up and walking around, so to not totally none the worse from being poisoned. Meh. I'm sure she doesn't have neurological damage. I totally forgot. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Like, she gets, like, one moment in it where she, like, coughs or something, which... Maybe she's still sick, and then everyone just glares at her. <laughs> yeah. It's like, come on, guys. <laughs> like, it uh, says something as to how bland of the, the characters are when the only Red Waller that I find memorable is the Cellar Keeper from the sheer fact that he's only mentioned once at the end of book two. <laughs> and it's like, doesn't even have a line, just mentioned by name once. And it's like, <laughs> That's more memorable to, memorable to me than any of these other characters. I don't know. Why? I, I, I do kind of remember Barlam, uh, who's Tim Ballisto's illegitimate grandchild. <laughs> yes, that does not make any sense. Oh, He's not necessarily illegitimate. Grandson. <laughs> He's his continuity-defying grandson. <laughs> and Bryony is Gonf's great-grandson, apparently. And so is Dandon from the next chronological book, which makes me think, did Gonf and Columbine have a whole bunch of kids or something? Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> or Gomp has a lot of things to tell his wife. <laughs> yeah. oh. I, I was actually going to say that if Danden is just a direct descendant of Bryony, then Gomp's likableness and, uh, you know, likableness and actually being a decent character skipped a generation. Yeah. Mm. Ooh. So, yes, we're in the epilogue, we're told, and, uh, yeah, yeah, that... Jod did actually uh, stay at Redwall, but he uh, ended up taking a wife, and yeah, yeah, that Bella eventually died a couple of seasons later. So, and I, I like the epilogue for Sunflash, where he became a farmer and a poet, and 
I changed his name to Sunstripe. Yep. Yep. And yeah, that's it. And Vale isn't even brought up again after. <laughs> eh, he was bad in the end. Oh, yep. okay. Oh, well. Except for that one little tiny bit of goodness. <laughs> and you're, you're that, you know what would have been great? His like last lines to Brian, and she's like, you saved me, why? He goes like, I tripped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? I tripped? How did I trip? <laughs> so that brings up the obvious question. Did he actually try to save Brian e deliberately? Or was See, it just comedy of errors there? I don't it's tragedy know. Tragedy of errors. His character isn't developed enough for me to know any motivation, so I cannot give an answer to that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I can either. I'm going to go with he tripped. <laughs> I, I can't. I got nothing. Yeah. Uh, which is very sad, because this could have been a much better story, and a lot of his stories are, like, a lot of them, Obviously, since I'm doing a Redwall podcast, since we all are, like a lot of these books grabbed us in a way that this one evidently didn't. No. Yeah. I like the last half of book two and, you know, two thirds of book three. Right. <laughs> yeah. I liked I liked book one a lot. I essentially liked everything that had nothing to do with Redwall. Right. In this book. Which everything was like to say. Yeah. Sunflash and Swartz stories are like the highlight of the book like i wouldn't mind rereading this we're just reading those portions you know yeah. i'm gonna liken this to watching godfather 2 the only good parts are basically the young Vito. no one cares about michael corleone in the current well then current day yeah and it's strange because salaman Estron, book five um did another story like it was Involves Salamandastron and then going back to Redwall. And I actually cared about all those people. Mm hmm. Yeah. Like the so Redwall plot. Do it. The Redwall plot in that one did feel like actually felt important. Right. Which I'm saying he is capable of making a story that makes us care about all of it, which mm -hmm. is sad that it didn't, it didn't work here. Yeah. No. Like, I honestly, I kind of go back to what I said in the previous episode where. I think the characters from Marl Fox would have fit in better with the idea of the Vermin Bay being taken into Redwall. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And, like, I feel like if Bryony's character had been better, this could have at least worked a little bit more, but... And she... Vale's character. And Vale, like, and everybody. Yeah. Like, <laughs> And, like, if we could have seen more of how Vale grew up to that point, is we literally jump from he's a baby that bites people to people blaming him for stuff and him having legitimate gripes against the friar who starts off by grabbing him by the ear and twisting it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, this is better than the framing, like I said, this is better than the framing story for Legend of Luke, which was essentially just eat, fight, eat, fight, eat, fight. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like, Sunflash was way more, Sunflash's entire story and journey is way more interesting than the titular plot of the book. Yeah, this is a really weird, weirdly chosen title. Yeah. Like, I remember when this book came out, uh, or when it was coming out, I was interested in, like, the idea of, like, oh, you know, like, a vermin growing up at Redwall. And then reading book one, I was like, where's Redwall? Right. <laughs> like, for the first third of this book, the title is a complete lie. Indeed it is. Um, yeah, I don't, th I, overall, I don't think it's bad i just think it's a very uneven book right yeah i mean like i've said before like my least favorite of these is still like i would happily read it over a lot of things because i really do like these books and i mean come on you, you can't skip the zigu saber tash fight you just oh, can't no. do that yeah. no that was definitely that was easily one of the highlights okay so I got a question for you guys. Mm -hmm. If 
if we go on the assumption that Outcast of Redwall is a terrible title for the book, what would you rename the book? Sunflash the Nice. Yeah, same here. That, that was my first thought. I was thinking something more along the lines of uh, the, uh, the Badger and the Hawk. I don't know. Hmm, that could work. Yeah. That could work. I like both of those. Or like a, a Badger Legacy or something like that to work in like Brock Tree and Bore the Fighter and Bella and poor Bark Stripe who nobody talks about. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Or the Prodigal Badger. Yeah. Yeah, something like yeah. A lot of good good suggestions. Yeah. It's basically anything except for Outcast of Red Wall. Right. Yep. yep. How about Six Claw? Just call it Six Claw and be done. Six all strange it. and deadly claws. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I don't, know. I, I don't. It's not. It doesn't bother. Maybe just rereading as an adult, it kind of bothers me just a little. But basically, because of the whole what we've mentioned in Spades already, the whole species alignment argument and you know, was Veil doomed to be, always be bad. But it's, I don't know that I'll ever come back to this one to reread it. Honestly. Oh, I will. I, I always do. Like, every couple of years, I'm like, I should reread all the Redwall books again. <laughs> oh, that's fair. Maybe I will. I mean, I do that with the Harry Potter books and oh. Jurassic Files, so. Yeah, I think this one is less species equals alignment and more of just underdeveloped characters i think if we're going to really tackle the species equals alignment it might be more towards tagarung that's the, well what's well put to a better better book for that to yeah. be perfectly honest yep and i really 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 like tagarung so mm-hmm. i'm excited to to see what what people's issues are with it because i think it was one of the first ones i read so i think i may have i may be viewing it through this haze of nostalgia but i'm just like i love that book and everything about it is great so. <laughs> I think Tagarung was actually the last one I read all the way. No, it Loam Hedge came after Tagarung, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it I think went... Loam Hedge was the last one I read all the way through before I took a break from the books. Mm-hmm. Um, because I remember starting High Hy- Lane and then dropping off of it and then going back to it and liking it, but noting that there were that book also had some pacing problems in it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I think that should wrap. Unless we have anything else to mention, I think this should wrap us up here. Oh, uh, were we going to mention our? Did we already mention our schedule in the last podcast? Like that we were going to. No, take but I did put no? it on Twitter. I was actually oh, okay. about to talk about that. Okay. So yeah, folks, if you're listening and as these episodes come out, we are done for the year, at least with books. But you're still getting new content, as is our established tradition as of last December. We are going to be doing a food episode mid mid to late month this year. So please Ooh. send us your recipes, uh, any pictures you want to give us, and we will talk about food of Redwall when it comes around. Yeah, Bonus exactly. points for uh, actually using the Redwall cookbook, and we might even invite one or two people on the show. We'll see. Heck, so. if people even want to try suggesting something, I wouldn't mind trying something new. I like cooking a lot. so Me too. Mm-hmm. So once the new year begins, we'll pick up again with um, Mariel is next. Yep. Mariel, yep. yep. Yay, I love her so much. Yep. Yes. This, that is the likable female character, Jakes. Good job. Make more like that. <laughs> yep. She is the anti-Bryoni. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, the anti-Bluefin, for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Bryoni was better than Bluefin. At least she had alliance of dialogue. Yes. Oh, granted, Sonya is still been better been than bit. Bluefin. Oh, I was going to say maybe there were points that Bryony shouldn't have had lines of dialogue, but, you know. Yes. I mean, at least she had half a personality. Yeah. Or a personality. How about dialogue? Um, All right. So should I do our list off of where people can find us? Be a good idea. All right. (gasps) 
You can find us at recorderonthewall.com. We are on iTunes and Google Play Podcast under Recorder on the Wall. We also are on the Eulalia subreddit on Reddit. We have a presence on the official Redwall forums, and we have a Twitter account at ROTWpod, as well as ROTWpod at gmail.com. Please feel free to tweet or email us. We like to hear the feedback. And yay! All one breath. Very good. All right. So we will um, pick up then. We'll see you for the food episode, folks. And come hungry. (laughs) Bye, everybody. Bye. Feast. 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 (laughs) Ha, ha, ha.